Action Service. Uh, he served as Director General of DG Trade of the Commission, Secretary General of the Commission, Head of the Cabinet of the Commission, President Kumar Mukrudi, and Director General of Education and Training. It says here he began his career in the Irish Foreign Ministry joining the Commission in 1999. If my recollection is correct, David, you actually started with the Department of Agriculture. Falling off the CV somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so with a, with a great advantage of, such as that, it perhaps no longer has yes, gone on to such, attain such wonderful heights in a subsequent career. But David has been a great friend of the Institute here over many years, and we're very much looking forward to his address today. Tom, ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to, to be here, and thank you for refreshing my uh, CV. Um, indeed, I did start in the international trade section of the Department of Agriculture, formative training, but that will be for the memoirs on another occasion. My experiences there, and their experience with me, by the way. Um, it's great to be back, and it's great to have this opportunity once again to be at the Institute. Um, it's always nice to come to Dublin. Uh, not least now that I'm living in Washington, it's nice to be able to fly backwards and forwards with free clearance at, at Dublin Airport. It makes arriving in Washington infinitely more pleasurable. The last time I came through, um, the gentleman from the Customs and Border Protection Service looked at my passport and was on my visa, my title is there, and he said, yeah, Sorry, what exactly is this, the European ambassador? He said, But don't they have, not all the countries have ambassador? I guess we also have a European ambassador. He said, Oh, it's very interesting. And then he looked at me and said, Don't you have to be German to have that job? <laughs> I thought it was very prescient of him, but uh, <laughs> I tried to explain that you know, other nationalities could also have jobs in the EU, so uh, he looked slightly convinced. Um, the, the, other, the, other, uh, the theme, of course, today is transatlantic relations after Brexit, which I think is not exactly the theme I suggested, but I'm happy to talk to it. Um, uh, I, I, of course, it, it takes me into the two things that whenever I speak in the United States, I have to say I'm not going to talk about. I have to preface all my speeches all this year in America say two things I can't talk to you about are the American elections, which are appropriate for uh, diplomats to comment on domestic politics and Brexit, because of course that's a, a matter for the UK. Well, we have at least had the Brexit vote. We still haven't yet had the vote in the United States. And my standard line is that, of course, we watch with great interest uh, what is happening in the United States. I have to say it's a remarkable privilege uh, to be in the United States at this time and to watch the vibrancy of American democracy at work. And that's not said with any any cynicism, genuinely. Uh, I had the pleasure, along with many other diplomats, of attending the two conventions. And it is a remarkable political process. But of course, um, we can comment on the outcome. And my standard line is to say that I hope the American people will choose wisely. But I was explaining to some colleagues earlier that when I said this at a, at a meeting in Brussels, and then I was asked, well, what do you think about Mr. Trump's remarks about NATO, I think, or something? I said, I'm sorry, I can't possibly comment, uh, but I do hope the American people will choose wisely. The headline by the Reuters uh, reporter out of that meeting was EU envoy says Trump's candidacy poses challenge for wisdom of US voters. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, as you can imagine, this, this requires me to be extremely prudent uh, in what I say uh, about, about any of the US elections. But obviously, uh, in transatlantic relations, the outcome of that election uh, is going to be crucial for setting the agenda uh, for transatlantic relations. Uh, for the coming period. I'll come back to that maybe towards the end. I mean, my sort of scorecard, I'm two years in Washington, and my sort of scorecard of transatlantic relations is, is certainly, you know, eight or nine out of ten. I think, I think the relationship is actually in very good shape. Uh, 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 on the positive side, we've had, for example, the Iran deal, which was an unprecedented degree of cooperation between uh, the EU and our member states uh, and the United States uh, in brokering uh, that remarkable uh, deal on putting a nuclear weapon beyond Iran's reach. Uh, we also played, I think, quite an important role in Washington uh, in trying to shape the, the response there, particularly of Congress. And myself and my German, and British, and French colleagues uh, spent a lot of time uh, going up on the hill explaining the deal from a European perspective, not interfering in the American process. But uh, I think we contributed to uh, the outcome, which enabled this deal finally to be to be approved, and we, we are now responsible on the European side. We're overseeing its implementation, but Rico Mogherini and his internal action service has the responsibility of uh, overseeing the, the implementation, and that's proceeding well. It's important, I think, to recall that the, that the basis of that deal was particularly the European sanctions against Iran. 
Of course, the US uh, had adopted sanctions and there were UN sanctions, but it was the severity of the European sanctions that really brought Iran back to the table. And some of those sanctions posed quite a lot of hardship on European countries. Greece, I remember, had to give up entirely importing Iranian oil at a time when it was its single the most important source of cheap oil. Uh, and that pain was taken by European countries, I think genuinely out of a sense of commitment to the international community and the need to achieve uh, an, important, an important goal. The same can be said, I think, of the reaction to uh, Ukraine and Russia's behavior uh, in the region. Uh, we have managed to maintain an unprecedented degree of transatlantic <coughs> unity and European unity uh, on this issue, which is not easy and complicated and not getting any easier. Uh, but there is strong uh, uh, transatlantic cooperation in the area of uh, the Minsk Agreement and the, the, the finding a solution to Ukraine uh, uh, and in, in the meantime maintaining those sanctions. I would also mention climate change. Uh, the, the Paris Agreement was a very historic agreement made possible uh, it, it, at least in part by, by a major effort by the Obama administration and the deal they made with China, but Europe has been a leading uh, advocate of climate change measures for going back many years and also contributed very hugely, I think, in Paris. And it really was a success story uh, of transatlantic cooperation uh, in an area of growing importance. Another element of huge importance, which is sometimes controversial, but uh, nonetheless, I think, a success story, is the whole digital agenda. The whole issue of the digital single market uh, and transatlantic data flows and transatlantic cooperation in the, digital, in the digital area, which is going to be hugely important for, for, for both our economies. We had the, the hiccup of the uh, judgment from the court, which uh, in the presence of a distinguished member of the court I defer to, but which caused quite some controversy in the United States. But we were able to put together uh, a new solution uh, with the privacy shield. It was a tough negotiation, but I think a good one. Uh, I believe that that new agreement would stand uh, a, a test, which undoubtedly will come in the future. But in the meantime, we have created we created a sense of certainty for companies dealing with data flows across the Atlantic, which is hugely uh, in our interest. More generally, the area of the digital single market, which in my view has the potential, is probably one of the most important projects that the European Commission has launched in many years. Uh, the, the completion and the transformation of the European single market into a digital market uh, has the potential to be hugely beneficial to American companies based here. And I always emphasize uh, in the United States that uh, we greatly welcome the presence of large American digital companies here who are well established, provide employment, and indeed, under our own treaties, are actually European companies as much as they are American companies. And they make a valuable contribution uh, to our economic uh, and social and employment life. Of course, that doesn't mean that they can't be subject to our rules, uh, and that uh, is, is, is an ongoing debate, uh, which I know will be the subject of further discussion. Uh, as the Commission comes forward later this month with more proposals on the digital single market. I try to explain to the, our American colleagues that the approach we're taking is to create a single digital market, but it cannot be a place where the digital sphere is unregulated. There is no reason why the digital sphere should be uh, some kind of unregulated space in comparison with the rest of the economy. Now, the issue is to get the balance right between uh, the burdens of regulation and the importance of innovation and moving with the technology and recognizing that regulating uh, a high technology area is not easy given the speed of change. But I believe that the digital single market will have a hugely positive effect for Europe and also for the United States. Getting the interface of the two jurisdictions is sometimes going to be complex and privacy is undoubtedly one of those areas which is going to continue to challenge us. I think the privacy shield is a good response, but this is also a moving target. And I think the sort of, you know, Americans are from Venus and, and Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus uh, uh, approach is not true. I don't think Americans uh, are, are more concerned about security than about privacy. I don't think Europeans are more concerned about privacy than about security. I think on both sides of the Atlantic, we're struggling to find uh, the correct way of balancing the issue of privacy uh, as a fundamental human right and the issue of security and the legitimate concern of our security enforcement agencies to be able to access the necessary information to protect our people. This is a common concern on both sides of the Atlantic. We do it in slightly different ways and getting the sort of the interconnectivity between our respective ways of doing it is going to be crucial to providing the kind of platform for a transatlantic digital market that we know we need for, for, for both of us. This brings me into the area of terrorism and security, where we have seen unprecedented cooperation, uh, 
transatlantically in response to the tragic events both in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere. We should not forget that terrorism afflicts the Middle East uh, infinitely more than it does uh, either the EU or, or the US, but still it is a huge problem for us uh, and we're working very closely. I have two people uh, in my delegation uh, from Europol, one of them an Irishman, Pat, Pat Byrne, uh, who work very closely with the US law enforcement agencies and we now have I turn to our colleague from the U.S. mission. Uh, we have 10 or 15 uh, U.S. law enforcement agencies with a physical presence in the Hague, in Europol, actively working on transatlantic cooperation in this whole area, which is intelligence sharing uh, and pooling of information, which is absolutely crucial in the, in the, in the fight against terrorism. Um, on the refugee crisis as well, we have, of course, had a particular challenge here in Europe, but I think we've had good cooperation with the United States. Uh, in, in particularly trying to address the political issues at the root of the problem, whether that's finding a solution in Syria or, or in Libya. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we have the coalition uh, uh, of our member states. The EU is, is less, not an active military participant uh, in the fight against Daesh and ISIS, which is very much at the heart of the, the refugee crisis. And finally, we have uh, TTIP. Now, I read where, um, actually, very, excuse my words, very carefully here. Um, Someone suggested during the week that maybe TTIP uh, had not succeeded. Um, I, I think trade negotiations take time. We've been negotiating TTIP for three years. Uh, I think I've said here and I've said in other places, uh, the Canada Agreement, which we're in the process of hopefully signing and ratifying, uh, took, took nearly seven years. Uh, we did conclude an agreement with South Korea in two and a half years, but frankly it was on the back of a very good American deal with Korea, which had not been ratified, so we had an excellent template which enabled us to go very fast, and the Koreans also had their own reasons for wanting to do that deal very, very quickly. Typically, uh, an ambitious and complex deal of the kind we're talking about in, in TTIP uh, does take uh, more, more than, than three years. Uh, we are continuing to work to see if this can still be concluded this year with this administration. I know that uh, Cecilia Malmström and Mike Froman are going to be meeting very regularly in, in the coming weeks to see if that is possible. It's challenging, but not impossible. Uh, but frankly, even if it is not uh, achieved this year, I do believe that this deal will be done, and I believe that it needs to be done. It remains a very, very important uh, element for both the United States and the European Union uh, of ensuring a greater regulatory convergence, greater economic cooperation. The transatlantic economic corridor is the largest, important, most important corridor in the world by far. And it would seem extremely paradoxical to me that with all the deals we're doing with other people, we could not do a trade deal with each other. Now, I know, and I saw in one of the Sunday newspapers over the weekend, yet another article claiming that this would lead to a lowering of standards, the imposition of American food standards on Europe, and so forth. It's very difficult to argue against this until we actually have a text. But I do ask people to look at the Canada Agreement which is a close template of what TTIP might look like, though TTIP would to be different. And I defy anyone to find anything in that agreement which leads in the direction which some of the critics are saying. Uh, there is not going to be a, a change in our rules on hormone beef or GMOs, uh, or on the way in which chicken has to be treated before it can be marketed because of a trade deal. That is simply not going to happen. It's not going to happen in the United States. They're not going to accept changes in their legislation because of a trade deal. We're not going to accept changes in our legislation because of a trade deal. Uh, and if you look at the Canada Agreement, by the way, and those of you who are interested in GTIP should also take a close interest in the Canada Agreement, <coughs> because the Canada Agreement, in my view, is one of the most ambitious, comprehensive, and potentially beneficial trade deals the European Union has ever negotiated. And to be very frank, if we cannot sign and ratify and put into effect that trade agreement, I doubt that we will have any credibility in the international trade circles going forward. This is a hugely important moment of decision for Europe European trade policy. And I say this because I'm not the EU ambassador to North America, I'm the EU ambassador to Washington. Uh, I have a, a very good colleague in, in Ottawa who will defend uh, the Canada Agreement, but because I really do believe that many of the issues which are going to be debated in relation to this Canada Agreement will also be relevant to the TTIP when it comes to be decided and concluded. So those are the very positive uh, sides of transatlantic relations, and I think that uh, the, the relationship is in, is in very good shape. Of course, we have a general election in the United States, and the single biggest determinant of the future direction of those relationships will be 
uh, the outcome of that election. And I've already said what I can say, uh, and I'm not going to add uh, for fear of somebody concocting another headline out of, out of my comments. But clearly, this is a hugely important uh, moment. Uh, it's also, I have to say, remarkably entertaining when you're there in the United States. But of course, we have to bear in mind that it's, it's not just political theater. It actually has consequences, consequences for the American people, but consequences for all of us. I'm tempted to say sometimes in America that it's the greatest piece of political theater in the world. And we were slightly jealous, so we decided to organize Brexit on the European <laughs> side to, 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 to have a European co-production of uh, political theater. Um, in fact, the, the Brexit outcome, uh, as we all know, uh, is what it is. I think we have to respect the decision of the British people. Many of us may regret it personally. I deeply regret it. It deeply saddened me uh, after nearly 35 years in European public service to think that a country would vote to leave. But this is the decision. There's been a debate. There's been a democratic vote. There is a decision. It has to be respected. On the other hand, I think that our British colleagues have to respect the fact that this is a decision which does not just affect them, it affects all the rest of us. It has major consequences uh, for the 27, uh, and of course it has consequences and will have consequences for transatlantic relations. And I know that many in the United States, when they're not focusing on the election, which is where their attention is primarily now, uh, are deeply concerned about what this means uh, for the future uh, integrity of the, the European continent, uh, the security posture uh, in Europe, the cooperation which we have, of course, on, on economics and trade, but also on what we do in the area of uh, military cooperation, foreign policy, security cooperation, uh, terrorism, uh, intelligence sharing. Much of this uh, is channeled through EU, EU structures and, 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 and uh, processes, uh, and how that will affect uh, the, the transatlantic relationship is something of deep concern to the American colleagues. We also know that the United States, of course, wants to see the best outcome possible to this situation, which reconciles the, the vote of the British people, their decision to leave the European Union, with the need for the United Kingdom to remain closely engaged on <coughs> the European continent and for the best possible relationships to be maintained between the UK uh, and the 27. The, the biggest difficulty I think we have uh, is the issue of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is the greatest enemy of, of us all, particularly for business, though I, I did have a psychology lecture once who tried to persuade me that the definition of maturity was the ability to tolerate uncertainty. Um, I'm sure that's true, but I think our maturity is going to be severely tested uh, in, in the coming months uh, and years. Uh, it's not going to be easy to bring certainty to this situation anytime soon. We have to acknowledge that. It, this is going to take time to work through. No one has a perfect, we've never done this before. No one has a perfect blueprint about how you might go about it. Uh, there are so many innovative elements in, in any reflection you begin on this subject that it's difficult to, to even know uh, how to start. And at the same time, I think what people do want uh, and hope for in the coming months is at least some clarity about a process and the beginnings of a process which offers a perspective of reaching uh, an, an outcome uh, in, in some kind of foreseeable time frame, whether that is the, the, the two years of Article 15 from whatever that is figured uh, or whatever additional time frame is needed for the parallel discussions on forging a new relationship between uh, the United Kingdom, no longer a full member of the EU, uh, uh, and the rest of us. So in all of this, uncertainty, I think, is going to be the, the greatest difficulty. It's going to have a hugely chilling effect uh, on investment decisions, uh, in the short term at least. Uh, maybe industry will grow more accustomed to the uncertainty and, and start then to reconsider these investment decisions. But this is really our, our biggest challenge. And in terms of transatlantic relationships, obviously this poses a huge challenge for the United States which wants to maintain the best of relations with the UK, the best of relations with the 27, collectively and individually, uh, and they frankly don't find themselves in a very comfortable position of trying to figure out how, how we're going to deal with this. And I think it's in the first instance a European problem, and we have to um, firstly get clarity as Europeans, including the UK, how we want to deal with this situation, which respects the needs of the, the decision of the British people uh, and the needs of the rest of us. Uh, including the importance of maintaining the integrity of the, of the EU and the fact, put simply, that there will be a difference between being a member of the, United, being a member of the European Union and not being a member of the European Union. 
Uh, I don't have the answers today. I hope nobody came hoping I would have the answers. Uh, but this is going to be a, a major challenge uh, in, 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 in the next few months uh, and how this, how this deals with the, the, the Council in Bratislava, uh, with the European Council in October. We hope some greater clarity can be brought in the situation and then we can see how we can also work with the United States uh, to take into account their interests and, and, and desire to be, to be helpful. What I do think, and what I would just like to conclude on, uh, is to say this, that after two years in, in Washington, I'm even more deeply convinced than I was when I went there uh, about the importance of the value-based agenda between us. Uh, the economic relationship is important, the security relationship is hugely important, but at the end of the day, when you look around the world, we are probably the two major regions of the world, I don't quite know what language to use, uh, because the United States is not a region, it's a country, we're a region, um, who still hold to the fundamental values that underpin the world liberal order that was set up in the second half of the 20th century. And that is under threat. It is under threat from outside, it is under threat from alternative actors such as China, or such as Russia, uh, who have a different vision of how the world should develop and the values on which that international development should be based. And frankly, it's under threat from within. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the United States election, but you've seen uh, the, 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 the people who are voting for Bernie Sanders, the people who are voting for Donald Trump. Th these are not people who are necessarily supportive of the global liberal order, which has brought so much prosperity uh, and, and, and security uh, to, to, to the West and also more globally. Uh, and you see it in Europe. The Brexit vote, uh, of course, it's a vote about the European Union, but it, it contained elements also of this uh, unhappiness with globalization, disillusionment of trade, with freedom of movement of persons. This is the, the big debate uh, uh, of, the, of the coming years. And I'm absolutely convinced that the United States and the European Union have a very important role to play in defending those values internationally, but also promoting them domestically uh, in ways which are acceptable to our, to our populations. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there are many challenges ahead. But as Vice President Biden said when he addressed uh, the Munich Security Conference uh, uh, last year and said that uh, we are each other's best friend of first resort. And I continue to believe that that will be the case going into the future, Brexit or no Brexit, uh, uh, US election, uh, whatever, whatever the, the American people decide. I'm quite sure that those values and, and that alliance will remain absolutely fundamental to making things happen in the world. The days when agreement between the US and the EU or Europe uh, was a sufficient condition to move the dial internationally are gone. I continue to believe that that agreement is a necessary condition to ever being able to achieve anything internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you.